believe we live in one of the most crucial hours of the church. We need to see every single person fulfill their destiny. And it is time that the church start to realize that the earth is watching and waiting for what only we can bring. Hi, I'm John Bevere. Welcome to The Messenger. You know, we're talking about relentless, the power you need to never give up. We are here now in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're down to the 8th and the ninth verse, where Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, and he is an adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Don't be one of those whoms. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Now, he says, be sober and be vigilant. Resist him steadfast in the faith. He now, Peter now deals directly with the fight. But the point that Peter is making here is he is like a lion and a lion prowls about on the lookout for those he can devour and he will do it if given opportunity and he will do it mercilessly. Now, he is a defeated foe, but he's a worthy opponent and should never be taken lightly. He has no affection, no compassion, no mercy, and he has one mission, to kill, steal, and destroy. If you were on the plains of Tanzania, Africa, and you were in the territory of a man-eating lion, you wouldn't casually walk through the region unarmed. If you did, chances are good you wouldn't come out alive, correct? On the contrary, if you're wise, if you'd carry a very powerful rifle and know how to use it, if arm, sober, and alert, you'd remain unharmed. And that's the way it is with us. We got a gun, we got a weapon, he's got none. He's been disarmed, amen? Now, Peter says, resist him. There is no question, this word embodies and conveys aggressive conflict. Once again, listen to Jesus' words of assurance. Behold, exclamation mark, I have given you authority and power over all the power that the enemy possesses and nothing, nothing shall in any way harm you. Isn't that good? His promise assures us that if you walk in his powerful grace, no one or nothing can harm you. That is significant. However, you have to use the power. He doesn't say pray and ask God to remove him. No, you and I are to directly and purposely resist him. Nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere can you find a scripture that instructs us to ask God to remove the devil. He can't. Huh, John, I can't believe you just said it. He gave the authority in this earth to man. He will not override that authority that he has delegated. He needs you to resist him. We are the ones that are to take authority on this earth. Who better to learn this from than Jesus? When he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, we have the three accounts at the end of the 40 days where the enemy comes and he begins to tempt Jesus. What did Jesus do? Did he pray to the Father and say, Father, get rid of the devil. It is the devil himself that is after me. No. Jesus looked at him and said, it is written. Why does Jesus say it is written? Because the word of God is a sword. It is literally a sword. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to see it as such. It is a weapon. It is real. It is more real than the natural. You may have a gun in the natural. You may have a sword in the natural, but it will not be as real and as powerful as what you've got in the spirit. You have the sword of the spirit, that very sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth when he returns to this earth, because once again, he'll be back in this earth to take authority. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, my, 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 my. So, you will not find Jesus once asking the Father to remove the devil. We are to resist him. Peter says, you resist him. James says, you resist him steadfast in the faith. Several years ago, 
a pastor came to my office. I'll never forget this as long as I live. This man had been involved in illegal drugs before he came to Jesus. He got gloriously saved, and he and I worked together on the same staff at a very large church in Florida. And I'll never forget watching this man during worship. Literally, tears would pour down his face. He was a very godly man, a very kind man, a very good husband. I mean, just a real, real, genuine man of God. And it used to really impact me seeing the tears that would come down when he would think about what Jesus had done to save him and deliver him. And I remember there was a day that came where he came knocking at my door at my office. And he came in and we sat down and we started to talk. It was the light chatting for a minute. And then he said, John, I need to talk to you. He said, John, several of the men in my family history have died of heart attacks. They've had real heart problems. And he said, I have been fighting the fear that I'm going to die at a very young age of a heart problem. And he said, this fear is becoming more and more overwhelming. He said, I have been really, really praying about this. He said, John, let me explain it to you like this. I'll be just driving my car down the road. And all of a sudden, that fear just grips me. And I just begin to sweat. And he said, there's times that I will literally cover my clothes with sweat from the fear of dying of a heart attack. He said, I've gone to the doctors. They say I look good so far, but I just can't shake this fear. He said, I have fasted. I have cried out to God. And as soon as he said that, I stopped him. I said, yeah, but have you dealt with it directly? He said, what? I said, you can cry out to God all you want, but God is the one that tells you to resist the spirit of fear. And I said, you know, Ken, and I'm just going to call him Ken. I said, there are times when the enemy really, really comes against me or my family. And I said, there will be times where I'm just fed up and I've had it. And I'll go out and find a remote place outside where nobody can hear me. And I said, I lift up my voice and I get really loud. And I'll be so angry. I say, all right, devil, it's a fight you want. It's a fight you're going to get. But let me remind you right now, I have a weapon and you don't. I have the sword and I'm going to cut you up into little pieces. And if you haven't had enough, when I'm done, I'm going to cut those little pieces into smaller pieces. But you will flee from me. You don't know how many times I've gone out and prayed that way. And I said, I'll do that. And sure enough, I'll see the results. And so, you know, we talked a little while longer and he left my office. We prayed together and he left. And I remember six months later, there was another knock at my door. And sure enough, it was Pastor Ken again. And he came walking in. I'm going to tell you, he had this heaviness on him. He had this look of gloom on him. And I already knew, oh my goodness, we're not going to have a good report here. And so he walked in, and he sat down, and I said, what's going on, Kent? And I already knew what the answer was going to be. He said, John, it's worse. It's absolutely worse. I said, what do you mean it's absolutely worse? He said, John, I'm now wrestling with this fear almost on a daily basis. He said, I'll be in the middle of a service, and my old suit just gets drenched with sweat from the fear of dying of a heart attack. He said, I will be in my office, and all of a sudden, it just comes on me. He said, I have been crying out to God like I've never cried out to God before. I have been fasting about this. And I said, yeah, have you gone out and fought the devil like we talked about six months ago? He said, well, no, I've been really crying out to God. I said, Ken, that is the problem. You keep crying out to God and you aren't de dealing directly with the devil. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, his head goes down and he starts withdrawing. And I realize, oh, no, I'm losing him. So I looked inside. I said, Lord, you got to help me really quick. I need help. And I said to him, I said, hey, Ken, God gave me this example. I said, can you imagine one of our boys or girls at a war? Let's say it was in Iraq, okay? And I said, they're in a manhole, and they're being fired upon by the enemy. And they get on the phone, and they call the President of the United States because he is the commander-in-chief of all the armed forces of America. And I said, they get on the phone, and they call the White House, and they go, Mr. President, the enemy is shooting at me. They're actually closing in. They are firing at me. They're going to kill me. I said, what do you think the president's going to say to that soldier? He's going to say, hey, we gave you the finest training in the world. We gave you the best weaponry in the whole world. We have given you the authority of the American government. Now shoot him. Yeah. 
When I said that to him, all of a sudden his eyes registered it. He realized, oh my, I said, you have got to be the one that resists the devil. You have got to be the one that uses the sword. And he looked at me and he got it. And I knew he got it. He walked out of my office. Three weeks later, he came skipping into my office. He had a spark in his voice, a twinkle in his eye, and I'm like going, okay, what's going on? And I said, what's going on, Ken? Pastor Ken, tell me about it. He said, John, you got to hear what happened on Sunday. I said, what happened? He said, my wife and I were driving to service, and he said, the thing hits me again, and I start sweating profusely on the inside of my suit. And he said, all of a sudden, I got so angry, and I started remembering the words that you spoke to me. And he said, you know, my wife has no idea what's going on. She's completely oblivious to what's going on. He said, all of a sudden, I got so angry. I slammed my fist on the dashboard of our car. He said, my wife about went through the ceiling when I did because she has no idea what's going on. And he said, devil, I've had it. And he said, I started quoting the word. And he said, John, when I slammed my fist down on that dashboard, he said, I had a vision. I had a vision. He said, I saw in my spirit Jesus seated on the throne. And when I pounded my fist down and said, devil, I've had it, I saw Jesus do this. Yes! <laughs> As if to say, I have been waiting for you to do this. He's never had problems with that again. Today, he pastors a very large church in the southern part of the United States, and he's still alive 25 years later. <laughs> Amen. Let's look a little closer at Peter's words. Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast. Everybody say, steadfast. steadfast. Say it again. Steadfast. If you recall, the word steadfast is a synonym of relentless. Now, this is where I find many lose the fight. The Bible doesn't teach if we resist the enemy once, he's forbidden to come back and try again. No, quite the opposite. He can try again and again and again. I've learned from experience, this is where many get discouraged and experience defeat. And what they think is, well, I guess it doesn't work or I must not have what it takes. That's a lie. Let me tell you another story. My wife, when she was a little baby, had something called colic. What is colic? Colic is when babies just scream, cry for hours every day. It usually happens about when they're three months old, and it can last anywhere from a month to two months to even in some cases three months. Doctors still don't know what the cause is, but they say it's just an undeveloped digestion system. So they just go through this excruciating pain. When Addison was born, our firstborn son, when he was about three months old, he started crying. And I mean screaming. And nothing could comfort him. Lisa would take him, hold him, do everything. So finally, I just take him and I just put him in my arms and I just start praying over him. And I, I just start praying in the spirit as loud as I could. And sure enough, he'd fall asleep. Well, this went on day after day after day. And finally, after about 10 days, two weeks, one night Lisa and I were getting ready for bed. I actually was in bed. I think I was reading or just lying there waiting on her, and she was in the master bath taking off her uh, makeup. And um, all of a sudden, we hear this blood-curling scream coming from the nursery. I thought, oh, boy, here we go again. So I just swung out of the bed. I said, honey, I'll take care of it. And I... I glanced at the digital alarm clock beside our bed, and it said 12, 11 a.m. And I remember walking into his nursery, picked him up, commanded that thing to leave him, started praying in the spirit, and he fell asleep within about 10 minutes. Next night, Lisa and I are both in bed. All of a sudden, another blood-curling scream comes out of the nursery. I looked at Lisa. I said, here we go again. So I got out of bed. When I'm getting out of bed, I look at the digital alarm clock sitting beside my bed, 12, 11 a.m. I thought coincidence. So I go into the nursery, pick him up, command that thing to leave, start praying in the spirit. Sure enough, he goes to sleep. Third night, Lisa's taking off her makeup. I'm in bed. Another blood-curling scream comes from the nursery. I said, oh boy. 
So I turned, got out of bed, and I did a double take. The digital alarm clock said 12, 11 a.m. I got so angry. I went storming into my dear son's nursery. And I will never in my entire life forget what happened. I didn't pick him up this time. I looked down into that crib and there was literally fire in these eyes. Because I'm going to tell you something. I had an awareness somebody else was looking through these eyes. It was the Holy Spirit. And I, with such authority and such strength, looked down, put my hands on his chest, and I said, you foul spirit of infirmity and colic, get away from my son. I break this curse that has been upon Lisa's family, and I command you to leave him and never return. Now listen, you would think that would terrify a child. He looked at me with the sweetest eyes and fell right to sleep. And he never had problems with it again. Now, let me tell you what I went through. The first night the scream came, the thoughts are bombarding my mind. See, John, your prayers don't work. You've been praying him for 10 days, two weeks like this. The second night, you are doing him no good. You have no power in your prayers. Your prayers are not effective. The third night, why do you even bother getting out of bed? Just let Lisa go pat him because it's not working. It was working. The, what you've got to realize is the enemy is such a formidable foe that he will allow you to jab him with that literal sword and keep coming back. He's like a little chihuahua. <laughs> those little chihuahuas, you know those little dogs that think they're Dobermans? <laughs> They'll come up to your ankle and go, right? And you go, get out of here. You go, get out of here. And he keeps coming back. Yip, yip, yip. And all of a sudden you've had it and you go, get out of here. <laughs> I've never done that, okay? <laughs> and what happens? He goes, <laughs> because he realizes you are relentless yeah. and you are determined to get rid of him yeah. that is the way you have to display it to the enemy that you are relentless yeah. Amen. in your pursuit to see the kingdom manifested yeah. in your life in your family in your world of influence yeah. Yeah. amen We must be more determined to lay hold of our freedom than our adversary's quest for bondage or destruction. See, the thing is, are you going to be less relentless than the devil? Or are you going to be more relentless, especially when you got the weapons and he don't? I've often witnessed tragic losses people genuinely receive from God. And in days, weeks, and months, sometimes even years, they lose what they've received. We are instructed in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, hold on to what is good. Listen to the words, hold on to what is good. Every believer should ponder, know, and stand firm in this exhortation. I learned this early in my Christian walk. When I became a born-again believer, I remember one of my friends took me to a meeting one night. Now you got to understand, I'm not used to these kind of meetings that I was taken to. And I'm sitting in the audience, and uh, I'm just listening to the speaker, and all of a sudden the speaker said, you know, the Lord is showing me there is somebody here that has lower back pain, and you really, really have wrestled with this for years, and it's right down here and right down low, and went on and on, and all of a sudden I thought, I knew that person was me. And I thought, I'm not going up there. I'm, not, I'm used to Catholic mass. I'm not used to people doing this kind of stuff. And, and, and I, I thought, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting there, and I know this woman's talking about me. Because most of my teenage years, I had unbelievable back pain. And I, I will never forget, I used to get up from shaving, and I'd have to hold my back like this, and I'd, everything, okay? And, and I remember, I thought, I'm not doing anything. And I remember, you know, she, she, she kept going. 
And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, she goes, I can't shake this. There is somebody in this place tonight. You have lower back pain. And the Holy Spirit wants you to know he wants you healed. And I thought, oh, my goodness, she's back on it again. And I know it's me. (laughs) So I thought, okay, I'm going up there. So I went up. Well, she and her husband prayed for me. And I'm telling you, the pain just went like that. I was like, whoa, this is amazing. So for the next three weeks, I enjoyed a pain-free life. I remember when I would lean over the sink and get up from shaving, I'd go, oh, it doesn't hurt anymore. It was amazing. And I was loving it. One night I'm in my bed and my, my apartment was lit by a moon. Okay, there was a moon out that night. And I remember all of a sudden this presence comes into my room and I felt like the blood in my veins went to ice because this presence comes in and I'm not exaggerating. The room got dimmer. And all of a sudden, fear just grips me. And I notice there's the pain. I hadn't felt it in three weeks, but there it is. Now, I was a young believer, and I had been immersing myself in the Word of God. And I knew what was going on. And I will never forget it. I threw my sheets off my bed. I jumped up and I said, oh, no, you don't. I got healed three weeks ago in that service and you are not putting this back on me. I'm holding fast to that which has been given to me. Now, the fear left, the pain left, and the room lit lit up to where it was before that came in. And I've never had problems with my back since. Are you seeing this? you got to hold fast to what Jesus has given us. I am so fed up with seeing people get genuinely healed in meetings. And then three weeks later, three months later, I hear that it's right back on them. Amen? you got to resist him steadfast. Everybody say steadfast. It is impossible for you not to receive. It is God's will for you to always win. The Bible says in James 4, resist the devil and he will flee from you. doesn't say the devil might flee away. You must know that the enemy is afraid of you. When he looks at you, he doesn't see who your friends see. He sees Christ because you are a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. Final word of caution. I've seen two extremes in the body of Christ in my 30 years of ministry. First extreme are those who are looking for a devil behind every bush. They've lost their gaze upon the master. My Bible says keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. My concept is this. This is the way I've lived. I keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, and if the devil gets him away, blast him and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. <laughs> Don't become one of those who are hunting for a devil beside every door. The other, which is a much larger group, are those who love God, but they ignore the enemy. The mindset is if I pay no attention to evil, it will eventually go away. That is such a lie. What you do not confront will not change. Do I need to say that again? What you do not confront will not change. Hi, I'm John Bevere. I want to talk to you about Relentless, the power you need to never give up. You know finishing is so important. In fact, it is more important how we finish than even how we begin. Jesus made that clear. The book of Ecclesiastics makes it clear. But yet, why aren't many believers going to finish well in these days? You know, the Bible predicts that. It says in the last days, many are going to go shipwrecked. Many are going to fall away from the faith. Why is that? I've been traveling all over the world for more than 20 years. And it has ached my heart to see how many people leave churches, how many people walk away from the faith, how many people still say they're Christians, but have lost all their drive and their passion. Why is this? I will tell you why. It's because they're not armed to suffer. This is what Relentless is all about. Think of it just like this. You're going into a hostile environment. In this hostile environment, bullets are flying. People have handguns. And you go into this environment and you get shot. How long does it take to recover from that bullet wound? It could be months. It could be even a year. But think about it like this. Before going into that environment, you take the time and put on a bulletproof vest. And then you go into the hostile environment and a few shots do get taken at you or your people. The bulletproof vest keeps the bullets from penetrating you. 
Now here's the question I want to ask you as a leader. And when I say leaders, you may be a father, you may be a mother, you may be a pastor, you may be a leader of an organization. Most of the people that I'm talking to right now, you all should be leaders because God says we're the head and not the tail. Now here's the question I want to ask you as a leader. Would you want to arm your people by putting on that bulletproof vest? God says, my people go into captivity. They're injured because of a lack of knowledge. Do you want to take the time to give this knowledge to those you love in your own life and be prepared for adversity? I believe what Relentless will do is it will arm you. It will prepare you from what life will throw at you. And the thing that we must establish and will be firmly established is where does tribulation come from? Where do trials come from? You'll know you'll be established so that you can properly fight because Romans 5, 17 makes it clear that all of those that have received God's abundant grace and have been freely put right with Him were to rule in life. People that are not armed to suffer, people that are not prepared and adequately armed with the Word of God that's found in Relentless are people that end up being ruled by life. It is my desire, my passion, to see the Church of Jesus Christ in America and around the world rise up and become strong. And I believe Relentless is a God-given tool that will prepare us for these days ahead. They're glorious days that are coming. They're victorious days that are coming. So I want you to become a relentless believer. <laughs>